Uh, one recommendation for you, just on the resource level, last one is a book by one of our professors, Dick Felcher, called Messiah in the Psalms. And the reason I recommend it to you is because one of the themes we're going to see today, and one of the themes we've been seeing throughout the entire book of Hebrews, as you know, is this idea that Christ is in the Old Testament, not just on a prophetic sense looking forward to Jesus, but that Jesus is there as the God of Israel. And the Old Testament is as much about Jesus as the New Testament, right? Uh, and we talked about how Moses spoke of Jesus, how Moses was a believer in Jesus. And one of the great Old Testament books that we all love is the Psalms. And one of the things you may not realize is the Psalms are all about Christ. Uh, they point towards Christ. Christ fulfilled them just like every other passage. So I really recommend this book by Dick, by Dick Belcher. He's a fantastic professor here in Charlotte. It's a great book taking you through the Psalms, and it helps you think about the grid that you study the Bible through, which is part of the issue we're going to face today is how do you think about the Old Testament and how does it apply to Jesus and us? So a great resource. If you're looking for a book to read over the holidays, since you've got a couple months off, I highly recommend it. All right, let's turn our attention to what God has to say to us in his word today as we dive into our very last study. And we're in Hebrews chapter four. Hard to believe. And we'll be looking at verses one through 11 today. Now, Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, as you turn there, probably is one of the most complicated and confusing passages in the entire book. Um, and uh, the same with Hebrews 3, or at least part of it. And so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be sort of going out of chronological order in this passage and pulling out themes from it to help sort of simplify what's going on. But listen to what's going on here, because what this passage centers on is that God has a tremendous, exciting rest for us as his people. Um, and it's not the rest that most people in this time period thought it was. So let's listen to that, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain, a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Wow, there's a lot there. Here's the upshot of what's going to happen today in this passage. And that the author of Hebrews is going to go to his audience and says, I know that you think you have reached the final rest because you live in Canaan, the promised land. Joshua got you there, and it's a great thing. But our author is going to say, but there's something greater. The rest of Canaan, as wonderful as it is, is not the ultimate rest God has in mind. Why? Because there's a second Joshua, Jesus, who has brought you into a greater promised land, into heaven. And for those who trust in him, there's a greater wet rest that awaits you. And as I thought about this passage this week, I thought, what a great ending passage for ending the fall and going into the holidays. Just a passage that's about rest, and we all need that message I know. So let me pray for us and then we'll dive into this this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for the second Joshua as much as we're grateful for the first. There's a second Joshua who came that delivers us to the real promised land. Lord, help us today to look to him as our great hope and our great rest, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as we start today, there's something I know that's true of you that's also true of me as we sit here this morning, and that is all of us are really, really tired. Now, I know this, not because I sort of, you know, figure out what your sleep patterns are and snuck into your life and did all this analysis. I know this because statistics, at least, tell us that Americans are facing an unprecedented sleep epidemic. 
And given that you and I are sort of the classic middle-of-the-road Americans, I imagine this is all true for you like it is for me, is that we never get as much rest as we need. In fact, I was looking at this article in Forbes magazine. This was just last month, actually, in Forbes, Forbes magazine. The stats are stunning. The average American gets more, just a slightly more than six hours of sleep per night, with 40% of Americans getting even less than that. And then you go back to 1910, and in 1910, people averaged nine hours of sleep per night. And you're thinking, I wish I lived in 1910. What's interesting about the sleep epidemic isn't just that people lack sleep. What's interesting about it is all the effects it's having. It's having an effect on their health and depression and anxiety and diabetes and cardiovascular disease, all linked to lack of sleep. And then you have the sort of drowsy driving problem. The wrecks in, in this country due to people who are sleepy drivers is astronomically higher than it's ever been. There's all industries born out of the sleep epidemic, sleep medications, sleep pills, sleep machines. How often have you heard about the sleep number bed mattress? How much have you thought about, well, maybe my mattress isn't good enough. I'm going to you know, spend $8,000 on another mattress so I can sleep better. And all of Americans are thinking we're tired and we need rest. Now, when you think about that on a physical level, and it's true, it's also true, and this is really where our passage is going today, on a spiritual level. On a spiritual level, you and I are tired. And when I say tired, I don't just mean physically, although we are. We're tired of how difficult the Christian life can be sometimes. It can be a slog, right? You're just feeling like you're trudging through it. You're bearing the burden, all the temptations and challenges. You're ever feel like you're walking through the Christian life just hanging on by your fingernails? Like, I don't know if I can keep going. And that's the sort of idea of, the, of Christians sort of being analogous to what the Israelites did in the desert. You're just trotting through the desert trying to hope you make it to the promised land, and you're tired spiritually. Whenever you're tired, what you look for is rest. In our world, we do this all the time. In fact, even this fall, as I think about sort of the way this fall is shaped up, it's been kind of a crazy travel time for me, and I'm sure it's been a busy fall for you. I've been telling my wife since the beginning, it's like, if I can just make it to Thanksgiving, if I can just make it a Thanksgiving, then I will be at a point of rest because all these sort of heavy travel times will be over. I'm out of town all next week. And if I get to Thanksgiving, then all is going to be well, right? But you know how it goes in your life when you get rest like that. It's good to be at rest on Thanksgiving, but you know it's only temporary. And then pretty soon you're back to it again, right? And it never quite gives you enough. You know what you and I need more than anything? We need a permanent rest, right? We need a full final rest, an ultimate rest that we can get to. And here's what's going to happen in our passage today. Remember, he's writing to Jewish Christians who are used to the Jewish worldview in the Old Testament. And if you were a Jew and you went to a Jew and said, hey, wh what's your rest? Their answer is going to be, well, Joshua got us, got us our rest. You know, M don't you remember the great story, the Exodus? I went to the desert. Joshua got us into the land of Canaan. Here we are. We're in the rest. This is the greatest land you could be in, flowing with milk and honey. And our author is going to say, uh, not really. As good as the promised land was, and it was good, there's something better, something greater. There's a second Joshua that came along, and he's going to give you even a better rest. Don't miss that one. Just because you're in the promised land doesn't mean you're going to get to the real promised land. Just because you're in a current physical rest in Canaan doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven. Make sure you don't miss the second Joshua. Now, the reason I call him the second Joshua, of course, is what we're going to see in the text, is that Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. In fact, I imagine most of you know this. The word Jesus, the name Jesus, you think is a rare name. Actually, in, the, in first century Judaism, Jesus was a very common name because it was the Greek name for Joshua. In fact, what we'll see in our text is interesting is that the word Joshua in our text and the word Jesus in our text are the same word in Greek. And they translate it differently in English so you don't get confused, rightly so. So you know there's the Joshua of the Old Testament and there's the Joshua of the New. And the message today is simple. Latch on to the Joshua of the New. Don't go back to the Joshua of the old. Why? Because the Joshua of the new is better. And he gets you to a better land. Remember the theme of Hebrews? Jesus is better. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Take a look at your outline. We're going to walk through this theme of rest, and we're going to do it sort of in three stages. And the way we're going to do it is we're not going to walk through the passage chronologically. If you were like me and you, you heard those 11 verses read, there's little snippets that are great, but you're like, I, I'm not tracking this. Um, it's a really kind of a complicated argument, and he kind of hops around. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to help by pulling a few threads out of this passage and breaking it down for you. So in Roman number one, we're going to sort of say, what is this rest that God is offering to his people? We're going to define it. And then Roman number two, we're going to ask, what's it like? What is the rest in heaven we're looking forward to really going to be like? And then thirdly, we're going to talk about how you get there. And this, of course, is the biggie. It's one thing to know about the rest, 
It's one thing to talk about the rest, but it's another thing to enter the rest. And that third Roman numeral is going to be key. How do you enter it? And that's going to be really where our author is going today. All right, let's start with that first one. What is this rest that God offers to his people? Here's where you need to dial back to last week. When we looked last week at the very end of chapter 3, when this passage from the Psalms was introduced, Psalm 95, which talks about the rest God had for his people. And so this word rest it happens all through the end of chapter 3 and into chapter 4, and so we have to sort of define what this is. And let's just realize that there's two meanings for rest here in this passage. Let's start with the first one you can see in point A there. Originally, when God talked about rest in the Old Testament, it was the land of Canaan. In fact, that's what the story is that you heard Dave teach on last week. If you think back to verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3, um, in that citation of Psalm 95, there's a very simple story going on there that Dave unpacked. And that very simple story is that the Israelites were taken out of the land of, of uh, Egypt and were heading towards the land of Canaan, and most never got there. Most never made it to God's rest in Canaan. Why? Because they were rebellious and they were complaining and grumbling, and they fell away and were lost in the desert. That whole phenomenon in the Old Testament is a well-known story, and it stands as a warning, right? The warning is simply, don't be like the Old Testament Israelites that never made it to where they were going. Now, but when you look at that story, here's what's interesting about our author. He doesn't take that story and say, therefore, if you want to go to, to get rest, I want you to pack your bags up and move to Canaan. He never says that, interestingly. He never says, well, you know that you could still have that rest today if you just moved to Canaan. No, what he realizes and what you need to realize is that rest in the Old Testament was sort of approximate rest, right? It was, what, it was like, think of the promised land as sort of a big symbol, as a big picture of what God ultimately had in mind for his people. And you don't get to heaven just by packing a bag and moving. You get to heaven through the person of Jesus Christ. But we need to realize is originally, when God uses rest in Psalm 95, it did refer to the promised land. And certainly most Jews would have thought about the promised land as a place of rest. In many ways, it was a place of rest. But what we're going to see here is our author does something very interesting. And this is going to be one of our big lessons today, is how he uses and, and understands the Old Testament. And when he looks at the promised land, he doesn't see the end game. He sees something that, that is forward-looking to the ultimate rest of heaven. So look at point B there. This is the key point I want you to see. Canaan was simply a picture of of the ultimate rest that God would provide in Christ. In other words, the land of Canaan that God had promised his people Israel and brought them into wasn't the final gig. It wasn't the, the ultimate goal. It wasn't, what, it wasn't as if God says, all I have for you is a plot of land here on this earth. No, God is saying, yes, I have that for a time, but that's simply symbolic and looking forward to the greater rest I have for you in heaven. Um, and so what we're going to see here, and I want to sort of prove it to you, there's several things in this passage that show that the rest God had in mind was not just physical, but ultimately spiritual in heaven. And this is sort of what you might call a lesson in hermeneutics, okay? Hermeneutics is a big word that just refers to how you interpret the Bible. This, our author is going to give us a great lesson in how you interpret the Bible, how you do hermeneutics. So looking at point B, let me sort of prove it to you, how we know the rest isn't Canaan, but heaven. And there's three things there I want you to see that bring this out. First bullet point there. If we go back to Psalm 95 for a moment, I want you to understand what's happening in Psalm 95. Psalm 95 is God coming to Israel through David, because he wrote the psalm, while Israel's already in the promised land. So here's Israel standing in the promised land when Psalm 95 is written. And God goes to Israel and says, don't be like those Israelites in the desert who fail and never entered my rest. I want you to think about that for a moment. If you're standing in Canaan and God says, don't, don't make the mistake they did where they never entered my rest, couldn't someone in Israel say at that point, well, but I'm here, I'm in Canaan, I've already entered your rest. And you realize, wait a second, whatever rest God has in mind must be something different than that. If he goes to somebody already in Canaan and says, don't fail to enter my rest, God must have a different rest in mind. And this is what I want you to see here. When God goes to the Israelites in Psalm 95, he isn't talking about getting into the land. He is indicating that even though you're standing in God's promised land, that doesn't guarantee you to enter into the real promised land, heaven. In other words, don't trust in being part of the nation of Israel as a way to get you there. Being part of the physical nation of Israel is not enough. You need to be part of the spiritual Israel if you're going to go to the real heaven. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment because I think one of the big lessons of this passage is don't trust your own sort of 
heritage, standing, status on earth as a reason you think you're going to get to heaven. The Israelites did that, and they made a profound mistake. Here's a second thing I want you to see that sort of proves this, and that is what we see in verse 1 of our passage, and that is the promise still stands. Look at verse 1 in your text. After citing Psalm 95, what does our author do in verse 1 of chapter 4? He says, therefore, the promise of entering his rest still stands today. Now think about that for a moment. If the promise still stands today, then that means that the audience that our author is writing to can still get to whatever rest is being talked about. But if the rest being talked about was the physical land of Canaan, then our author would say, hey, that rest still applies today. And if you pack your bags and move to Canaan, you can enjoy it, right? No, but that's not what he says. The promise still stands today, and you can enter it by faith. You don't enter this promised land by packing your bags. You enter this promised land by faith. And what you realize here is the present promise of rest means That whatever rest is in mind in Psalm 95 that our author continues to go back to, it cannot be the promised land that's ultimately in view. It has to be the real promised land in heaven. And this is a lesson for you about the way Israel works in the Old Testament. Remember, one of the things I told you you're going to learn in the book of Hebrews is how the Old Testament and New Testament relate. And what I want you to see about the nation of Israel is it had a whole infrastructure about it. It had all kinds of things about it that were symbolic and pointing to something else that was yet to come. And what we're learning in this passage is the land is one of those things. The land was symbolic and looking forward to something else, namely heaven. And there's other things in Israel that we'll see later did the same thing. Another thing that was like that in Israel was the temple. The temple, as we'll see, particularly when we get to chapter 7 through 10, was another thing that did exactly this. The temple was not the final deal. The temple is just a picture of something that was ultimately going to be real. In other words, God was going to really dwell with his people someday. And it was going to be through Christ. So what you realize here is there's many things about Israel's infrastructure, the nation, the setup, the temple, the rituals, it all pointed ahead. And our author's making that plain. Don't think that you should go back to the old ways. Go, going to the land of Canaan is not going to get you to the real rest. But then there's a third thing here that I think really captures this in terms of proving, uh, if you will, that the rest here is spiritual, and that is the comparison to Joshua in verse 8. So I said I would hop around, so now we're moving from verse 1 to verse 8. Take a look at verse 8 for a moment. This is a stunning statement. For if Joshua had given them rest, referring to the Israelites, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Now, when we hear that, we think, oh, okay. But you've got to put yourself in the mind of a first century Jew hearing that. Joshua was the hero, right? He, he, like Moses, he kind of finished what God had started with Israel. And he was the crescendo in their mind of all that you were trying to shoot for and aim for and Joshua's our hero, and he got us in the promised land, and we have rest. What are you talking about? And our author said, no, 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 Joshua didn't get you to the real rest. Because if he had gotten you to the real rest, why would Psalm 95 have been written? Psalm 95 was written because Joshua didn't get you to the real rest. Yes, he got you to the land of Canaan, but the real rest can only be gotten to spiritually through Christ. And that Joshua will not get you there. You need the second Joshua. And you can see there in your notes Uh, what I've highlighted is what I said a moment ago, and that is Jesus is really the Greek word for Joshua. Uh, And I love the play on words that's going on here. And I know this would be hard to get if you weren't looking at it in the Greek, but there's a a, a huge point when the play on words, and you can't miss it, and it's simple. Which Joshua are you trusting? Or if you want to put it a different way, which Jesus are you trusting? Because if you were to call the Old Testament Joshua by his Greek name, it would be Jesus. Are you trusting the Jesus that took you into the physical land? Are you trusting the Jesus that's going to take you into the heavenly land? Which Joshua are you leaning to? And the whole point here is simple, which is don't go chasing after other ways to get rest when the real rest awaits you only in Christ. And even though you and I aren't thinking about moving to the land of Canaan, thinking that's the way to get rest, you and I rely on other things for rest other than Jesus, don't we? I want to think about that with you for a moment. What other things do we run to? We're not going to run to a physical plot of land, probably, like the Jews were tempted to do. But what other things do we run to as a substitute rest that only Jesus can provide? Yeah, a few thoughts on this. (laughs) Ha, vacations. Now, how how much, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, Have you ever noticed how much we hope in our, our vacations? In fact, I find myself doing this so much that I have so much so much hope in my vacation, I'm stressed out about my vacation, right? I'm like, isn't that the, 
wait, am I missing something here? I must be relaxed on vacation. I'm like, this has to be the greatest week of my life, right? <laughs> Everything has to be perfect and wonderful. The weather has to work and every meal has to be fantastic. And I've got to have the best room and all that has to be there because that's what vacation is for. That's where real rest is. And then I get there. And what, is, what happens in every vacation, even when they're great, you're kind of disappointed, aren't you? Now, there's nothing wrong with vacations, and they do give you a sense of rest, but when you, when you get in them, you realize there's something broken about our world that just doesn't get it done, okay? And the greatest vacation you can imagine is never going to get it done, okay? What, another, what other things do we look to besides that for our rest? What's that? Weekends. Weekends, yeah, okay? Weekends are classic, right? You're slogging through the week. Friday comes, oh, thank you, Lord, Friday's here. Nothing wrong with that. Weekends are a great break, right? But what do you notice about week- weekends when Sunday night comes? Is they end. <laughs> and they're over. And you're like, I need like a weekend from my weekend, right? I need a vacation from my vacation. Can this not continue on? Here's the thing you're running into in life. Is no matter what you turn to in this earth, it's a proximate, limited, temporary rest. Even good things. Vacations are good. Weekends are good. I mean, we could list other things we look to for rest. Maybe it's just, I just got to watch a lot of TV, right? Just check out. I'm going to rent a movie. By the way, there's nothing evil about renting a movie, but you realize when the movie's over, you got a little break, but then the real world still awaits you. How are you going to get real rest? Here's what our world's doing. Our world is busy chasing all these little proximate rests. And when you realize they're chasing it, when they realize it doesn't work, they just go to the next one. And they're like, well, if vacations aren't doing it, then maybe getting a bigger house does it and more money. And then I'll have longer weekends. and I can retire early. And some people are like, if I really want to rest, I should take this medicine because it makes me feel good. Or I could drink these drinks and I'll get rest that way. And you see people busy their whole life chasing rest. This is what our world is doing. They are busy chasing rest. All the while they're sleep deprived, as we just read. And all the while there's an answer in Christ. Here's what our author doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want us to join that chase, okay? That doesn't mean you can't take vacations. Of course you can. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't enjoy your weekend. Of course you should. But never hope in them. Because if you hope in them, you're going to be profoundly and repeatedly and always disappointed. Why? Because they were never intended to give you ultimate rest. Only that can come through Christ. So here's what I want you to see in this first Roman numeral. Is that Canaan was like a, 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 like a little picture of heaven. And you just and, and God gave that picture to the Israelites for a reason, but you can't hope in the picture. You got to hope in heaven. Don't fall into our traps of the world where you chase these little proximate rests around, thinking they're really going to satisfy. They're never ever really going to satisfy your heart. Before we leave this first point, look at the key implication there. And I've sort of uh, said this, but I want you to see what it says. The key aspects of the Old Testament. In the land of Israel was the land, temple, and priest. They were not ends in of themselves. They were pointing forward to the full redemption that Jesus would bring. That sentence is the whole book of Hebrews. Haven't you seen it so far? Is Moses the final deal? No, there's a better Moses. Is Joshua the final deal? No, there's a better Moses. Are angels the final deal? No, there's someone greater than the angels. Is the temple the final deal? No, Jesus is better than the temple. This is the theme of the book, and you're seeing it loud and clear right here with this theme of rest. Okay, let's look at Roman numeral two. What's this rest going to be like? So this question is a humongous question. This is just another way of asking what's heaven, what is heaven going to be like? We could do a whole Bible study on that, right? We could do an entire semester on what heaven would be like. And I fear we don't think about it enough. We think about how to get rest here so much that we never think about rest in heaven very much. We think about how great our home here can look. We never think about how great our home there will look. And I want to suggest to you, and we can't do it all today, that we need to spend more time dwelling, thinking, and meditating on the great rest that awaits us in heaven. And our author here wants to find a way to communicate that to you. He's thinking, okay, what analogy can I use to help you see what rest in heaven is like? You can almost imagine our author trying to come up with a way to say it, okay? And the land of Canaan is a way of saying it, right? It's kind of like a great land you're living in, and heaven's sort of like that. But he comes up with another way to say it, and here's how he does it. Our author says, you know what heaven's like? Heaven is kind of like joining God in his Sabbath. His Sabbath rest has been going on since the beginning of creation. And when you go to heaven someday, you get to join God in doing what he's been doing. You get to join him in his Sabbath rest. This is actually a pretty good analogy, I think. I mean, if you want to think about how to describe heaven, that's one one good way to do it, is it's kind of like joining God 
in his heavenly Sabbath rest. Okay, let's break this down for a moment. Uh, We see this, as you can see under point A, we essentially join God in his heavenly Sabbath, and our author unpacks this starting uh, in verse 4 when he says, For somewhere he has spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. In other words, he says, don't you remember that passage in Genesis where God created for six days and he rested on the seventh day and then even when the seventh day was over, you know what God continued to do? He continued to rest. Now this doesn't mean God's inactive. This doesn't mean that God is sort of in heaven asleep or something like this. No, God's busy in in redemption and salvation and providence, but in terms of creation, God rested. And our author's looking for sort of a way to help you understand what heaven's going to be like. You kind of get to go, join God in his heavenly Sabbath. Now, by the way, that only works as an as a analogy if you understand an earthly Sabbath. Okay? If you say, hey, heaven's like joining God in his, in his, heaven, or in his heavenly Sabbath, and you're like, what's the Sabbath? That argument's not going to work, right? And so as we'll see in a moment, our understanding of the earthly Sabbath is going to be very important if we're going to get heaven. Because heaven's going to be even a greater version of that. So what's going what's, what's to happen in heaven? Flip your notes over. You'll see the next thing. In heaven, we get to rest from our works. Look at verse 10. Again, I know it looks like I'm hopping around. Well, it's not, it doesn't look like I'm hopping around. I'm hopping around, right? But I'm doing this on purpose because I said this passage is kind of confusing, so I'm just trying to pull these threads out for you. But look at what is heaven's going to be like in verse 10. This is a great verse for you if you want to even begin to rest now. Verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. In other words, if you go to heaven, all those labors and trials and tribulations and temptations of the life of the believer will be over. Here's what I want to sort of set out for you as the great hope today. When you get to heaven, it's not just that you get to rest physically you will certainly be sort of physically rested, even though immediately in heaven you won't have your body yet. You'll get a resurrected body later. But, so there's a sense in which you'll have physical rest. But the real rest that, that, that is described here is a rest from the trials of the Christian life. Okay? What, what do you experience in the Christian life? Is the Christian life is, is labor. And it should be, by the way. We'll come back to that later. The, the, the Christian life is striving. The Christian life is hanging on. The Christian life is enduring temptations and trials and persecutions. The, you know what the Christian life is like? It's, like? it's like being in the desert. And if you're in the desert and you see that promised land way out there, you're like, oh, I can't wait to get to that promised land. But in the meantime, what are you? You're in the desert. And it's in, it's in a sense, God is saying, you know, when you join God in heaven and his heavenly Sabbath, you finally get to rest. And if you're here this morning, and I know this is true of all of you because it's true of me too, you're, you're thinking about being tired more than physically. You're thinking the Christian life is just hard. And if you ever wondered sometimes when you think about the Christian life whether you're going to make it to the end, maybe I'll just give up. And we think that maybe we'll give up because we know people who have given up. And we're like, well, maybe it's just easier to give up. And what I want to encourage you at here is that there's rest that waits for you. And you get to join God forever in his heavenly rest, and you will work no more. There'll be no more strivings, no more temptations, no more trials. There will be peace and rest forever. And that, that vacation won't end. That weekend won't end, right? That holiday won't end. That is forever, permanent, ultimate, perfect rest. Now, if there are ever something to hope in, by golly, that's it, right? When you, when you compare it to that, you're thinking, golly, how silly is it to chase all the earthly rest? How kind of ridiculous is it? You might even say it's kind of embarrassing and we go around and we sort of put our hope in all these earthly things, and we're like, golly, I guess I don't really believe in a heavenly rest if I think these other things are going to satisfy. Let me hope in that. And if you hope in that, that's what's going to get you through the desert, right? And that's the whole point of the passage, is that you need to keep your eyes fixed on that. Remember two weeks ago when I talked about the tightrope walker. Stay focused on that heavenly rest in Christ. Don't look down. Keep pressing on. And this passage is about making it to the end. Now, when you think about this, He sums it up in verse 9 there. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is just another way of saying there's a rest for you as followers of God. There's hope for you. You get to go enjoy that heavenly Sabbath someday. 
forever and ever. Now, if we're going to really get that, though, we need to understand the earthly Sabbath a little bit. So notice point B there, and this is important. What implications does this whole idea have on for how we observe the weekly Sabbath? You need to understand there's a whole lot that could be said about this, but in the Old Testament times, of course, the Jews have observed the Sabbath on a Saturday, for lack of a better way of saying it. And ever since the resurrection of Jesus, Christians, viewing themselves as the new Israel, continue to observe the Sabbath. They observed it on Sunday. And Sunday very much was the Christian uh, Sabbath. And I gave you some verses there of what we see Christians doing on Sunday. They're worshiping on Sunday. They're doing ministry on Sunday. It was known as the Lord's Day on Sunday. Uh, they gathered together on Sunday. They gave uh, tithes and offerings on Sunday. They looked out for the needs of others on Sunday. Sunday was the day for Christians in the ancient world. Now, it's only when you understand that Sabbath that you understand what heaven is like. And so let's just think about this for a moment. Look at that statement I have in that little bullet point. The weekly Sabbath is or ought to be a little taste of heaven. I want to plant an idea in your head you may never have thought of before. When you go, when, you, when your Sunday comes, that is supposed to be a little taste of heaven. It's like a little microcosm of heaven. It's not that different than the way the land of Canaan was a microcosm of heaven. Your weekly Sabbath is a little picture of the kind of thing heaven will be like. Now, of course, that's probably discouraging to some of you. You're thinking, wow, if you went to my church, you wouldn't think that's what heaven's like, right? You may think my church doesn't seem like heaven at all. It might seem like the opposite place. Uh, but it's what it should be. And I, wanna, I want you to think about that with me for a moment. What, what is it about Sunday, the Sabbath day, that is a picture of heaven? What's true on that day that will also be true in heaven? I want you to process this together with me for a moment. Yes. Okay. When you worship on Sunday, you are giving a little foretaste of what you're going to do in glory, and that is worship Christ. Um, and you're going to worship him forever. Don't, don't think of that, uh, though, as this sort of, I'm going to be singing the same hymn for 10,000 years or something like this, right? No. Don't think of it like that. But there's a sense of adoration and love that you're pouring out on Jesus. And when you're with Jesus forever, you get to pour out that adoration and love forever, just like you're being with the one you love. You don't think that, that doesn't sound bad to you, does it? Being with the one you love? Of course not. So don't think of it as like singing a hymn for 10,000 years. Think of it as being with the one you love and showing adoration. So worship is key. When you worship on Sunday, do you realize that's a little foretaste of heaven? What else? Yep. Ah, fellowship. When you gather on Sunday, you're together with the saints. Now, it's a fallen version of that because we're still sinful we're still fighting all the trials of this life so it's not a perfect picture of heaven by any means but you ever have a moment at church or maybe in christian fellowship when there's such camaraderie and such such connectedness and such bondingness between brothers and sisters or sisters and sisters that you feel like wow this is amazing that moment and it only comes now and then doesn't it is a little taste of heaven because forever and ever you're going to be not just with jesus but horizontally with one another and the great news is when you're with one another you'll be redeemed and restored and you'll be who you're meant to be you ever, ever, ever had a relationship with someone and you realize you get a glimpse every now and then of who they really could be? And sometimes you, it, they're not the person they could be. But every now and then you get a glimpse of who they could be and you're like, wow, I wish I was around that person more. That's the person that we'll all be in heaven. We'll be who God made us to be in all our fullness. Do you want to spend time with your fellow saints if, if that's true? And the answer is yes. So, you know, Sundays are a little picture of heaven in that way too. What else? Right, absolutely. Your, your distractions, your discouragements, the things that you bog down with, you can put those aside. And I guess the word that we really could use here to describe that is in heaven you get to rest. Because on Sunday, what should you be doing? You should be resting. Here's a challenge for you today. I want you to rethink how you spend your Sundays. And when I say I want you to rethink how you spend your Sundays, I don't mean uh, you know, make sure you show up at church. Well, that's a minimum. I, I obviously would want you to hopefully show up at church, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rethinking the way you view your Sundays in terms of its purpose. Its purpose is not, oh, I have another obligation and a meeting to go to. No, the purpose of Sunday is I get to little, have a little microcosm, a little taste of heaven here, because heaven's going to be joining God in his Sabbath. So when I obey a Sabbath here, I get to participate in a little bit of that. So you should be worshiping, fellowshipping, enjoying the saints of God, and resting and not working. You know, when I, when I have people in my church that want to run off to their office on Sunday, I'm like, look, you're missing the point here, my friend. That's the thing you don't want to be thinking about on Sunday. L take your Sunday and then look forward to the ultimate rest that's coming. 
I mean, we, need, we need to recalibrate the way we think of that day. You know, I hear people all the time tell me things like, you know, I never have time to pray in my life. I'm so busy. I'm like, well, what, what do you do on Sundays? People say, you know, I, I hear that all these great Christian books are, can be read, and I, I want to read these Christian books. I don't have time. And my question is, again, what are you doing on Sundays? And people think, you know, I'm just so tired, never get to rest, never get to sort of stop the craziness of life. And my question again is, well, what are you doing on Sundays? Don't miss the point here. How can you look forward to heaven better by starting with the thing God gave you that points to it, namely a weekly Sabbath that we should all be looking to? All right, let's look at this third Roman numeral this morning. We've looked at sort of what is this rest, and the answer is it's heaven. Secondly, we ask what's it like? Answer, it's like, a little, it's like an eternal Sabbath. And then thirdly, how do you get there? And maybe this is really the whole point, right? You really want to make sure you, you know, think about it with me for a moment. After all we've looked at, do you want to go to this place? Do you want to get there? Of course you do. And so the question is, don't miss this third room, and we'll make sure you're getting there, right? Now, what are the thing, what's the things our author do to make sure that we're getting there? I'm going to give you three Fs here. And these three Fs come from this passage, but they really are a great paradigm for you to think about the three Fs that you need to think about to, to get to the eternal rest. And let's talk about them one at a time. And the first is unexpected. The first F is fear. Realize some among the people of God won't get there. Look down at verse 1 again. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, look at this amazing next statement. Let us fear. There's that F word. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The same thing comes up in verse 6. Those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of their disobedience. Here's the thing that our author says, the first F for you if you want to enter in the promised land is you need to take this seriously. You need to tremble. You need to realize there's people that won't make it there. There's people that you think are Christians that aren't. There's people among the people of God who will fall in the desert just like the Israelites fell in the desert and they'll never make it to the real promised land of heaven. Don't just think it's automatic. Statistically speaking, there's people in this room who will not make it to the final rest. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Statistically speaking, when you look at a room with 150 people in it, I, my, my prayer is that we all will make it there, but there's some who think they will and they won't. Some in a room this size in five years will leave the faith. Some in a room like this think they're Christians but aren't. What I want you to realize, you've got to start by having a sober appreciation and fear of this is not automatic. This is not something I can just relax and rest about. No, you've got to take this very, very seriously. You know, when I, when I talk to people in church all the time, I sort of get the sort of classic, you know, sort of religious, lackadaisical attitude that people give about things where they'll say, well, you know, I'm sure it'll work out. I talk to them about their spiritual life or their, their spiritual future. Like, well, it's going to be fine. Stop worrying about it. No big deal. It's going to work out. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home, and my parents are Christians, and I was baptized. I'm a member of this church. It's all going to work out. I don't have to think about these things. I don't have to reflect upon them. Don't worry about it. It's all going to be good. That type of, of approach is exactly the approach our author is saying do not take is a presumption that your status will get you there. Think about it for a moment. If anybody had a promise that they would make it to the promised land, wouldn't the Israelites have a pretty good bet at getting there? I mean, here, these are God's people. He delivered them from Egypt. Surely they're going to make it, and many of them didn't. In fact, most of them didn't. That's a very sobering thing. Do not assume for a moment as you sit here this morning that if you're a member of a good church, or if you go to a good Bible study, this one or another one, or you uh, grew up in a Christian home, that this is an automatic for you. No. You need to take seriously and ask the question, am I part of God's people? And one of the things that comes up in this passage, Dan, you, you saw it repeatedly when you read it, is that the word today keeps coming up. Today, don't harden your heart. Today, repent and believe. Today, make sure you're not going to drift away. Today's the day of salvation. One of the things I want you to think about as you think about that word today is to make sure that you are part of God's people, aware of your standing with God's people, even today. The, 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 I notice what the word isn't when it talks about the day of salvation. It doesn't say, well, the day of salvation is tomorrow. This is, what the, this is actually what the, the, the non-Christian does, is they'll put it off. They'll say, well, tomorrow. The day of salvation, it'll, it'll be tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll reflect upon my future. 
Tomorrow I'll reflect upon my eternal status. Tomorrow I'll reflect upon whether I'm in the fold. No, today's the day. The Psalm 95 refrain, and by the way, Psalm 95 is God himself speaking through David. Today, don't harden your heart. Today's the day of salvation. Don't miss what this is. So what's the first F here? The first F here is really plain, and that is you, you've got to make sure that the complacency and sort of self-assurance is put aside, that we really are aware of who we are. And if, you know, if you're sitting in this Bible study today, and you hear this message in Hebrews and think, I don't, I don't know if I'm actually a Christian, then today's the day, right? Don't, don't wait for another day. Today's the day to make sure you get that right. Don't say, don't say the word tomorrow. If you say the word tomorrow, then you will have missed the point of this passage. So fear is the number one starting place if you're going to get there. Look at the second F. And this, impo- this is important, and that is faith. We enter through heaven by faith. We see this all over the passage. Let's look at a few examples here. Uh, verse 2 is a great example. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. And then look at verse 3 as well. We who have believed enter that rest. Now what's going on here in the book of Hebrews is what exactly we learned in the book of Romans, right? For those of you who are in my Roman study, you remember how much we hit on this. What is the mechanism, what is the instrument by which you're saved? The mechanism or instrument by which you're saved is not your good works. It's not your merit. It's not ritual. It's not your family. It's not your heritage. It's not your attendance record at church. It's not who your parents were. It's not whether you're baptized. Your mechanism for salvation is belief. Now, here's the thing. Our world misunderstands what faith is doing, though, in this equation. And I want to clarify it because it's really important. Some people think that, we're, that, that it's the faith that saves us. And I want to clarify that actually that's not the way the Bible nor this passage sees it. It's not so much that the faith saves us. What saves us is Jesus. Faith is just the way we get Jesus. Okay? So faith is merely an instrument by which we get the thing that saves us. So don't think that I'm saved by faith means I'm saved because I have this emotional feeling, a feeling like I believe, or I'm saved because I did this meritorious act called faith. No, faith is just grabbing a hold of the thing that saves us, namely Jesus. What that means then is the most important thing about your faith is its object, what you're believing in, right? This is why I'm always fascinated when I, you know, hear modern cultural folks talk about the importance of faith. They kind of have that Oprah Winfrey version of, of what faith is. I hear Oprah all the time talking about, oh, just faith is great, and we're people of faith, and we've got to have faith. I'm so glad that you have faith, and we're, that's what matters is just being a believing people to have faith. But notice what Oprah never talks about is the object of your faith. It's like, well, what are you believing in? And for her, it's like, well, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters? It's just you got to have faith. Just be a faith person. And I want you to see here that this is not what's happening in Hebrews. Hebrews isn't putting faith up as the object. Faith is the means by which you get the object, namely Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the thing that you want. You want that real Joshua, that second Joshua. So as you think about the second F, okay, this is a corrective for us. We need, to, we need to realize, how do I get to heaven? Answer, I've got to have Joshua get me there. How do I get to he- heaven? I've got to have Jesus, the second Joshua, lead me into the promised land. So how do I get Jesus? I believe. I trust. I rely. It's not, it's not so much that my faith is the thing that saves me. Jesus saves me, and I just get Jesus by faith. What's the third F there? Fight. What I love about this passage is it combines two things we think are separate. That you're saved by faith, not by works, but you still need to fight once you're saved. And when I say fight, what I mean is strive, pursue, persevere, stay in the game. How do you know someone's a real Christian? There's lots of ways to know, and and I won't go into all of them, but here's one of the main ways you know is that they stay in the fight okay perseverance is one of the marks of a true believer i want you to see where this comes up in our passage it comes up a number of places uh, but you'll notice it comes up particularly in verse 11 let us therefore strive i want you to think about that word with me for a moment let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience here's the thing faith is the channel by which you get jesus which gets you there but that doesn't mean that the Christian life is passive. It doesn't mean you just sit around and go, well, I'm just looking at my clock and 
well, someday I'll be getting to heaven. There's not much to do now. It's all about Jesus, right? Well, it is all about Jesus, yes, but it doesn't mean you just sit there, right? There's a sense in which you're hanging on, you're pursuing, you're fighting. And what's interesting is that in the Bible, Paul does this a lot, but so do other authors in the New Testament. They're always comparing the Christian life to other vocations and activities. So being a Christian is like being this. Being a Christian is like being this. Um, and all of those have this theme of striving, working, laboring attached to them. Who could think of some examples that the Christian life is compared to? Christ being a Christian and pursuing the Christian life is like being what? An athlete. Okay, Paul comes up with this analogy in numerous places in his letters. Think about it for a moment. That if you're a Christian, that you need to be thinking of it like an athlete. You work, you strive, you, you train, you run. It's hard labor, right? So there's a sense in which if your Christian life is like an athlete, then that should be marking your Christian life. So if someone has a passive Christian life, I'm like, well, you're, does it look like you're a, a, a sort of spiritual athlete? No, there's a striving there. Okay, athlete's one. What's another analogy? Warrior, a soldier in the military is another thing that Paul says, is that being a Christian is like a soldier. You're, you're fighting. You're laboring. You're working. You're, uh, you're going on the attack and being on the defensive. It's not easy, but you're in the throes of it. There's a third one, a little bit harder. Okay, builder actually is one. Not what I had in mind, but that's one. Yep. So there's agricultural one. One of the one of the ones that comes up interestingly is that the Christian life is like like ha, like going into labor. Okay, it's going into labor. It's like you're you're what's what's the what are you looking forward to when you're in labor? Answer to it to be over, right? <laughs> but that's really not the that's not really what you're looking forward. You're not looking forward to be over. You're looking forward to the prize, right? What the prize is is that beautiful baby you hold in your arms when labor's over. The Christian life is like being in labor. Is there something great coming? But in the meantime, it's hard. Now, why does this all matter for you? Here's why it matters. One is so you don't fall into the Christian life being passive idea, which is certainly a problem. But here's also why it matters. If you're in the middle of the Christian life today and you're laboring and you're working and you're tired, don't think for a moment that being laboring and being tired means that there's something wrong with your Christian life. And this is a corrective we need to get today. Sometimes we have this idea that if if I'm living the Christian life and I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I'm kind of feeling like I'm hanging on, I'm barely getting there and it's just striving and labor, I'm like, yes, welcome to the Christian life. Don't think there's something broken with your Christian life if you feel that way. That's the life before you get to the finish line. There's going to always be a dimension of pushing and striving and running. If you're spiritually tired today, it doesn't mean anything wrong in your life. It doesn't mean there's something broken in your life. It means welcome to the Christian life. It's even more of a reason to look forward to the rest that awaits you. Can you imagine a woman in labor saying this to the doctor? Halfway through labor, she says, well, I think there's something wrong going on. He's like, what, what, what's wrong? She goes, I'm really tired. <laughs> Doctor's going to be like, um, yeah, that's why well, it's called labor. Or can you imagine an athlete? You know, he's out on the field. He's running his halftime. He's like, coach, there's something wrong going on. The coach is like, what? What's the matter? He goes, I mean, I've been running around out there. I'm tired. And the coach is like, well, yeah, that's, it's an, you're an athlete. You're supposed to run. Don't miss the point that Paul's make, or that the author's making here, which is that the Christian life is about striving. There's nothing broken about your Christian life if you feel this way. We need to realize this is part of the Christian life. What do you do in the midst of that striving? You look to the finish line, okay? Focus on the end with Christ and the rest that awaits. Now, make no mistake about it. We get some of that rest now. Christ living in us, we can rest in him now. The Sabbath day, we rest now. I don't think it's all labor and work. There's, there's elements of rest now. But if you're, if you're struggling today thinking something wrong with your Christian life because it's hard, I'm saying that's the Christian life. In fact, in some ways, it shows you're in the fight. And to be in the fight is to be someone who gives evidence of being a believer. Okay, lots to think about today. So many things. Here's the summary line of all of it. This passage is simply saying, Stop chasing all the proximate rest that we chase. For the Jews, it was maybe the land of Canaan. For us, it could be vacations or money or what have you. There's only one real rest. And the old, old Joshua doesn't get you there. The new Joshua, the real Jesus, gets you there. And it's heaven that awaits. And it's great. And when you get there, you get to be in a great eternal Sabbath with God forever and ever. What a great way to head into the holidays as we think about what a great message this is. Okay, let's... Moved to our discussion groups. There's a lot to talk about here. And as we transition, I'll uh, pray for us and ask God's blessing on that time. Let's pray. Lord, your grace is sufficient to get us through the labors. And Lord, we look forward to that great finish line where we get to enjoy real rest.
And that real rest isn't just a place. That real rest is a person, you, that we get to be with forever. May that be our hope. Bless our conversations now in these groups, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.